This is Jedi General Pong Krell. I welcome you to the Voice of the Republic podcast. Listen to this podcast. That is an order. Hello and welcome to the Voice of the Republic podcast. This is Bonnie Peace, Baru from Star Wars. Time to see you smart enough to join the hunt. The hunt for the Voice of the Republic podcast. So, I hear we're going to be taking out separatists on the Voice of the Republic podcast. Hello Star Wars fans across the galaxy, welcome to the Voice of the Republic podcast. My name is Daniel and joining me is fellow host, Rari Williamson. Another week, another show, guys. Oh, no. You had to do that, didn't you? I've waited too long. It, so. it could have been, been the end of a perfect week for me, but yet again, you've ruined it. That's my job. Ah, I suppose that's true. Ah, oh, so, now that you've ruined my week, go ahead and introduce the guests. Are you sure you don't want to do that to ruin my week? <laughs> Why would I be so cruel? Because your name's Daniel Schofield. I'd watch it, mister. Watch what? <laughs> oh, okay, just get on with it. No comment. Um, okay, first of all, we have... Voice actor Richard Green, who voiced the characters Low Terran and Rex in Star Wars The Clone Wars, the season 3 finale episode Had One Lost, and Wookiee Hunt, so who are you, Richard? Hello. Hello. And we're also at, joined by boy, young voice actor Kellen Gott, so how are you, Kellen? I'm doing pretty good. It's a, just another day, another whatever. Nah. So how did you get into voice acting? How did I get into voice acting, or how did Richard get into voice acting? For the sake of it, how did both of you get into voice acting? Oh, Richard, you go first. Ladies first, all that. (laughs) All right. Um, You know, I got into voice acting, um, I guess about, uh, well, considerable while ago. Because I didn't like acting in television. Um, I found most of the scripts were pretty stupid. And most of the reasons that they were written was to keep people watching the commercials. And voiceover acting allowed me to spend less time and make about the same amount of money. And I could put my creative efforts into making independent film and music. So um, for me, it was a, almost an economic decision to get into voice acting. I'm a storyteller. I'll always be a storyteller. You know, just this, this way I get to tell the stories I want to tell. Y'all still there? Yes. Yeah, what, about, what about you, Kellen? Oh, um, well, I got into voice acting four or five years ago back on YouTube when uh, everything was shiny and brand new and uh, untainted by the uh, um, unpurities of today. Um Back then, Machinima wasn't really a pay-worthy thing, so we just did it for fun. And um, I, I didn't really know what to do my, with myself on YouTube. I, uh, I tried animation, but that didn't really work out. So I started uh, making Machinima, and one of my friends said, Hey, can you, uh, can you voice this character for me? I'm like, I, I've never tried, but sure. So I did it, and I developed a taste for it, and uh, four to five years later in 300-plus independent parts on YouTube, here I am. Yeah, that's really cool. And how did you both get introduced to Star Wars as well? I think I saw Star Wars the first week of its opening, <clears throat> the original feature. Um, You're so old. I am. I'm well. I'm classic. How about that? Okay, um, classic's a good word for it. But you still look it. young. Still feel. Still kick your ass. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I'm Star Wars. Is, I mean, it's just the original movie. I, you have no idea having grown up, all of you, in a world where Star Wars was fully 
fully dominant before you were even born. You have no idea how revolutionary that movie was. We didn't expect it. Nobody did. Sci-fi was, you know, at its height, at, at the best, it was, you know, uh, 2001, Kubrick's 2001, which was, a, you know, a very existential, intellectual uh, piece of, of science fiction. Or it was, you know, Plan 9 from Outer Space, this goofy sci-fi bullshit. Um, yeah. Star Wars came along and it was just, it was revolutionary and it was back. It wasn't just Star Wars. It was that Lucas and, and Spielberg with him and, you know, through the Indiana Jones movies and stuff, they ushered in a, a, the back to the thrill ride of cinema, you know, where you had heroes to root for and there were bad guys and it was clear who was who. And, you know, they really got to the essence of what the roller coaster of a good movie is. Uh, or t any good rollicking good story, and Star Wars I think changed the landscape dramatically. I don't think Aliens would exist if it wasn't for Star Wars. Agreeable. Yeah. <clears throat> so how did you first get introduced to it, Helen? Oh, um, well, I I learned about it way before I got into it. Um, one day, uh, I believe I was in fourth grade and um the third episode had just come out and my dad knew one of the guys on there I forget his name but he uh got me and three of my friends and my dad uh uh VIP tickets to see it on opening day at some theater in Hollywood so I I, I like that it, it was um it was a fun time i don't quite remember what happened that day, but that that was definitely where it all began. Uh, there was a bit of a lull in my fandom, but um, after a while, uh, I was introduced to uh, The Force Unleashed, which is one of my favorite video games. And um, after finishing that, I'm like, I'm surprised about how little I know about this universe. So I'm, I'm still studying, but I, I'm definitely into Star Wars now. Kellen, yeah, uh, you don't know this. I don't know if it's on my IMDb, but I was a jet Jedi jet fighter pilot or something in the first Star Wars video game. Oh, really? The the first one? Like, wh which one? What's the title? I don't know. I have no idea. I believe it was the first one. And I'm going on to IMDb IMDb right now to, to check. <laughs> And that's because why... you piqued my curiosity, sir. <laughs> and that's why smashing his keyboard real hard, folks. <laughs> Green! Richard Green! <laughs> okay. Yeah, just don't look him up on Wikipedia. That's a music guy or something. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you a music guy, Richard? Uh, you know, I'm pr it's probably both me, maybe. I mean, there is a guy named Richard Green who's a great fiddle player and is a friend of a uh, cousin of a good friend of mine. Uh, there's a lot of Richard Greens in the world. In fact, I was named after the guy, who, an English Richard Green, an actor who played Robin Hood in a 1950s television series called Robin Hood that was written by blacklisted American writers who went to England in order to be able to earn a living. Well, that's cool. Very interesting. Um, also, I found the video game Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2, Rogue Leader. Yeah. Yes. Was that the first one or no? Uh, it's the second one, but I think it's pretty early. Okay. I think it might have been my first video game ever. Oh, well, I'll be sure to um, check it out however I can. Thank you. Yeah, so... um. I think if, with Rari's permission, we can get on with the questions. If permission granted, folks. You, you need you need you need a button to unmute your microphone faster. <laughs> I was just fast for you. <laughs> yes, that's fast enough. Thank you. Okay. Honk, honk. Oh, Rari. Anyway, hello there, Rich. hello there, Richard. Hello. Ah, so. My questions are, <clears throat> how was your experience on the Clone Wars and would you like to play someone else in the future episodes of the show? Um, I always like to do 
as much voiceover work as I can, because it allows me to develop as many other projects as I can. On this particular show, I'd love to do more episodes because I thought they were just a really, really great group of people to work with. And you felt uh, George's presence in the room, even though he wasn't there between sessions or during the sessions that I was working on. Uh, we would get notes from George, and uh, there just seemed to be a lot of camaraderie amongst the production team, and the actors all enjoyed each other. So I'd, I'd be happy to do it again. I felt good. It's at a great. We recorded at LA Studios here, which is not that far from where I live. And it's a, just a great studio with really good coffee and candies and stuff. <laughs> so, I've been there before. Yeah, it's a great place on Coenga West. And they're just great people at L.A. Studios. But also this crew of everybody who worked on the show is is great. Really great. Yeah. Uh, and Rari, um, I believe you've got questions for Richard. Hint, Rari. Hint, hint. <laughs> Yes, ask away, ask away. Unmute! I'm unmuted. I'm talking. Are you, sh are you sure about that? Dude, that is just such a fail if you say that when you can hear me. Now, hush, hush, and go play with your little toys. Now, to business. <sighs> so, Richard, my first question yep. for you is, were you instructed to make any vocal differences between the two traditions you voice, slow tone and fix? Yes. Uh, they, they weren't particularly specific. They just wanted a difference in the character. And uh, generally, as an actor, you don't adjust your physical, you adjust your, your, your character. You adjust the, your attitude. So you change what the character's thinking about and approaching and what their goal is and what their their uh, their action is, per se. And then it it can, it, can, it will come out in the voice if you have a different person. And, you you know, you probably drop it if you're really, really low on the first voice. You want to go higher to give as much contrast. But really, the things that change the voice are not so much pitch and tone, which they can control in the in the uh, in the in, in post post production. But it is attitude and its rhythm. The attitude of someone affects whether their rhythm is staccato or it's leisurely and uh, melody, you know, whether you're, you're, you're moving up and down through, through words or, you know, those things make a character sound more different than actual tone, which is, is adjustable. I'd be, I'd be, I would yeah, add. that's really cool. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that's really cool. I would, I would only add that uh, <clears throat> it is often the case when I get hired for uh, video games or animated series, I think the, the pay structure works that, that they can ask us to do more characters for less money or something. I don't know what the deal is, but so oftentimes we'll all do a couple of extra characters. Um, I would sometimes voice, you know, we're... Uh, you know, for like the Batman series or something, I would do Yuko Strange and a couple of other roles during the course of one session. Yeah, that's really cool as well. And um, my second question for you is, what was it like working with the other cast members of the Clone Wars? Um, you know, I'm so bad with names. <laughs> I don't have the cast sheet in front of me. So, um, uh, D D was on session with you, wasn't he? Yes. Um, um I am DB to the rescue. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll, uh, I'll just yep. say random names who I believe voiced in those episodes and see if you remember them. Remember okay. them? Is that okay with you? Sure, go ahead. Ashley Eckstein. Yeah, she was great and cute, beautiful and interesting. And uh, having a really interesting time in her career seemed like she had her feet really on the ground and was just really good. You know, it's like for what we do in voiceover, it's all about focus. You're, you're, it's, it's just like playing Cowboys and Indians when you're a kid or whatever other game you play. It's all about focus and how much you can believe. And with all the stuff going on around you, we're on camera, that's even more. But microphones and glass plates in front of you and other actors standing to your left and people drinking coffee, focus is everything. Can you, can you get into get into it and create an environment where the other actors feel something? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I imagine uh, James was some fun to work with, huh? J 
James yeah, Earl Taylor. Yeah, he always cloak him, James Earl Taylor. Oh, yeah, very, very good. Matt he Lamp. Like yeah, I've actually met James Earl Taylor at a convention. He's a really nice guy. Very, like, very nice. Like, there's a lot of time for the fans as well. That's actually you know, career and all. Like, he actually, pref- I'm not sure if I'd have you two know Richard and Helen, but he actually has his very own stage show, Talking to Myself, where ah. he goes over, oh, you know, yeah, where he goes over, like, his voice acting career. I've seen that, his show in, like, in person, live. Right? It's really, really, really good. Like, oh, yeah, I've seen a sample of that on YouTube or something. Yeah, it's nothing negative you can actually say about this show. Like, most one-hour stage shows would just, like, bore the hell out of me, basically, but I, yeah. I wasn't bored once during the visit of I don't know how you feel about Verse, but uh, I have a feature film that I directed that is just, we, we released it ten years ago. It's called Seven Years Zigzag, and it's told entirely in narrated rhyme. It's all about the voice. The only voice you hear except for background singing is mine during the course of the piece. Wow. I'll have to check that out sometime then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with Matt. Funny thing, the, produ- the producer just Skyped me of that movie, and I hadn't talked to him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Alex Graff. Anyway, carry on. Cosmic. <laughs> yes. Was Matt Lanter there as well? Yes. <laughs> I'm getting really good with this, knowing all the <laughs> names. <laughs> Uh, so Ashley Epstein, James uh, Taylor, Matt Lanter, they're the main ones. Um, uh, Corey Burton, plays, was he there? I, no, I I'm not sure, but who plays um, Obi-Wan? James uh, Taylor. James. Yeah. yeah, so he had just gotten uh, a, uh, a Tesla automobile. Oh my God, really? Whoa. Yeah, he, was, okay. he lives in Santa Barbara and he had just gotten a Tesla and he brought it. We were all checking it out. It was pretty cool. That, that, like the Roadster, right? Yeah. That's amazing. I love Teslas. Yeah, Obi Wan wasn't actually in that, and I did those episodes. That really no, but he's, really but he is the guy. Yeah. He only, he vo- only voiced Flo Koon in those episodes, I think. Actually, no. I think he voiced one of the more minor transitions as well. I think he voiced the one called Lagon or something. I don't think that one was named in the episode, though. Um, what wonderful voice. He has the round, he has the ability to have that round kind of voice. Really quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We also actually, a while ago, in one of our first episodes, with this being episode 18 of the podcast, we interviewed um, Zach Hans. He played, he voiced um, the main Tundo Shin Gang. Was he there yeah. as well? Yeah, yes, he was. And we were at the same agency, so we spent some time together. Absolutely cool. Good guy. I'm trying to think of anyone else. Uh, probably a few lesser known ones I'm forgetting. Uh, was like, uh, from what I heard, there was like a lot of different voice actors in that episode. Yeah. In the episodes, I mean. Yeah, I'm fairly sure um, the two, the two lesson, the oh, not lesson, the two more background young Jedi, the other ones, um, Omer and Jinx. I'm fairly sure they had uh, new voice actors, like voice actors who had voice on the Clone Wars before. But I can't remember their names. I don't recall. Yeah. I know we came back in. Uh... I think we came back in six or eight months later to do something for another episode, but I cannot remember now. It seems to me that we not only did the sessions for those two episodes, but they brought us back in at some point down the line for something. Maybe a season six episode. <laughs> Possible. I don't remember. It's scarily that I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, next question. What was your favorite scene involving one of your characters? Um, you know... I have, uh, I don't know if you, you probably have not seen my animation reel because I don't, it's not on my website. Um, I'll send you a link to it. It's, uh, we use the moment when I get shot by Chewbacca. (laughs) Uh, And that was, uh, I thought, I just felt like, you know, 
Chewy shot me was kind of cool. I just, <laughs> my oh, favorite. yeah, that's a great thing to have on your reel, Chewbacca shooting you. I think it's pretty cool. Hey, come hire me. Chewbacca shot me. <laughs> <laughs> the amusing thing is, though, if you think about it, uh, out of your two Transoceans, although Tarin was the fair known one, he gets killed. But yes. Kri- yeah, but Krix, your lesser known Transocean, he survives. He's only yes. knocked unconscious during the episode. That's yes. kind of amusing if you think of it. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, like, all the main Transocians die, and then, like, we had a lesson on one quick smug, and another one, they all survive. Well, you know, they, they, they have a amazing ability to keep taking the same elements and, and reusing them in new ways. So keeping one of the characters alive from that is a, kind of a smart move, I think, in terms of... Yeah, it'd be kind of cool if they did, like, a kind of revenge story. Like, those three Trent Oceans who survived, like, going after a yeah. or something. That'd be an interesting story. Yes, yes. Well, you should write it and send it in. Yeah, celebration year of two in July. I'll make sure to mention that to Dave Filoni there. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he's going to be at that event. Very cool guy, by the way. Yeah, definitely. Seems really nice. Really it's, nice. Really into it. Really into working with George. Really, really yeah, and like he's a, he's like a Star Wars fan, just like any of us really. Like he knows what the fans want and all that. Yeah. yeah. And then my final question for you is, will you be going to Star Wars Celebration you have two in Germany in July, or is it too soon to say? You know, honestly. Uh, it hadn't crossed my mind. Uh, I'm launching History of Cool, this project here at Next Step Studios. We are uh, deep into it right now, and the actual launch will happen in March. So we may be not traveling for a few months. Um, but uh, I will check into it. I didn't. I wasn't actually aware of the date, so I'll check into it. It's not something that I usually go. I'm not a big convention buff. I think it's great that they have them, but um, I'm, I'm, I don't like big crowds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the dates are uh, July 26th to 28th. I'll check it out. Where in Germany? Uh, Essen, and their convention center is called Messe Essen. Messe Essen? Yeah, Messe Essen. Messe that's Essen. The, yeah, Messe Essen, that's the name of their convention center, and the town is called Essen. Yes. Wow. What, what you said about Big Revs kind of reminds me of what something Daniel Logan, the young Boba Fett, said at Celebration 6 in Orlando in August. Like, he was like, oh, I've been trying to get toilet break for the last hour, but all these fans, they seem to be crowding around my table, making camp there. <laughs> like, he was like, saying something like that. It was really funny. Well, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things that I, I find interesting about... Um, the relationship between our work as performers or writers or directors or musicians and the public is that, you know, nobody's fallen in love with Richard Green, but some people have fallen in love with some of the characters that I've portrayed. And that really the fan and the actor's relationship to the character is sort of similar. You know, I mean, I, I put on the character and I play the role, but, uh, I'm separate than the character, and if and if the character is is, is touches me and t- it, it has a better chance of touching you as an audience member, but it also is separate from me. And so you know there are characters like Hugo Strange, is a real good example. I didn't create that character. I didn't write it, and I didn't even create the voice signature. It was Frank Gorshin, the great great impressionist and actor Frank Gorshin. He died before they finished this this that episode, and they hired me to replace. Uh, replace his dialogue in some places and then to do more episodes. And although I think I evolved the character and I feel very attached to him, um, you know, it's Frank's design. And I love the character, but I, I almost like an audience member might. So it's kind of funny to, you know, to have people surrounding you and, and you're the representative, you brought the character to them, but it's really not you that they're celebrating. They're celebrating the character and sometimes you can do that along with them. It's fun. Yeah, I know what you mean, because like, um, there's one of my um, friends over Skype here, um, 
he like is a big fan of your work, especially with the character you mentioned, Doctor Strange. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much for having me and for also allowing me to invite my my friend Helen Bob, who I think is just an incredible talent, enthusiastic, both actor oh, and storyteller. <laughs> Oh, geez, you're too much, Richard, you're too much. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of you, and uh, and also to you, everybody on the line. Dan? Hello. Daniel, do you want to read the Facebook questions quick? <laughs> I suppose I can read through them very quickly. Um... All right, go ahead. i got a couple more minutes. Shoot. Okay, so from Daniel George, Jeff says, Dear Mr. Green, I have several questions for you. Have you seen the episode your ten dozen characters appeared in? And if so, how did you feel when you saw that your low Taran squadron squared off and held his own for a bit against the legendary Chewbacca? Well, you know, he really didn't hold his own too. <laughs> it was great. It was because it was unexpected. I mean, I knew what was going to happen, but I didn't really see it. And, you know, I'm a big fan of the original Star Wars, and uh, Chewbacca is just, you know, the perfect wingman, so... It was great. Felt fun. It was really <laughs> fun. Wordplay. <laughs> His next question is: I am a huge fan of your performances, Doctor Huge, Strange, and animated series, The Batman. Would you like to return to the Clone Wars and voice a villain that has the same manner of speaking as your Doctor Hugo Strange? Yeah, I, I can't say the same manner of speaking, but uh, certainly that kind of lyrical kind of character that's all over the place and can play it up and chew up the literal furniture. Yeah, it'd be fun to do anything with that a guy that that's that's that rhythmically wild. And uh, you know, I'm I like telling stories and I like working with other people who like telling stories. And there's, you know, few storytellers in the world and few stories in the world that are as cool as the whole Star Wars phenomenon. So yeah, I'd return to do anything and you go strange. It'd be an interesting place to start a character from. Yeah. And his last question is speaking of the awesome Dr. Strange, would you like to return to voicing the character in a future Batman project? Like beware of the Batman that is coming soon. Yeah. You know, again, uh, I, I like telling stories and, and I do it in a whole bunch of different ways and whatever I'm, I'm, I feel very, very lucky to be in the business that I'm in and to be able to support myself and my family doing this stuff. And anybody that calls me up with anything, that's a reasonable job. I'm happy to do. I'd love to go back to Batman. I just really like that character. And, um, I worked on that show with, uh, um, Dwayne Capizzi, who is just a brilliant producer who now is doing, or was last season doing the Transformers. He did the first couple of seasons of Transformers. So anytime that Dwayne calls me up for anything, including a Christmas party at his house, I'm, I'm down for it because he's such a talented guy. So yeah, I mean, it'd be fun to go back to Batman. Um, you know, and whatever else comes along, I'm happy to do it, even uh, another podcast down the line. So thank you all very much. And he finishes off by saying, thank you so much for all the amazing work you have done over the years and may the force be with you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, so that's all the questions then. Yeah. Excellent. Guys, I should sign off. Uh, we have History of Cool work to do. I, I recommend that you all check it out. Go to historycool.com. It's probably not launched yet, but will be within the next few weeks. And uh, thank you very, very much for inviting me. It was great you joined us in the podcast tonight and hopefully we may speak to you again at some point sounds good i look forward to seeing you guys when you come to visit los angeles too we'll have to give you a tour of our studio <laughs> <laughs> oh so yeah so thanks you might be waiting a while yeah. I, hope I hope i hope you remember me <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a patient man i'm a patient man come visit me anytime rory bye-bye don't worry i'll remind you <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah, so goodbye. Bye bye. And I gotta be uh, heading off to. I got a birthday dinner to go to. So thank you guys Who's so birth, much for having me. Is it, is it your birthday? Oh, it's my. It's def. Yes, it's my birthday. <laughs> I'm I, it, not. Not today. Not today. Of course. Not on. Uh, on Sunday. I'm finally going to be eighteen. So, yeah, that's fun. And I'm finally going to be eighteen next year. <laughs> It was, oh, okay. it was my birthday on Wednesday. <laughs> and I'm still... Oh, happy birthday. We're weak buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still older than you, Harry. Okay. All right. Anything before I go, guys? Or... That's everything. Yeah, that's...
All right. See you later. Hope we can do this again. Bye bye. And yeah, I'm still. And yeah, I'm still. <laughs> and yeah, I'm still older than you. <laughs> Older, but not more mature. Oh! <laughs> I'll, I'll admit that. Yeah. Well, you can't be denied, can you? Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. What are you doing to your microphone? <laughs> it was leaning against the wall, and all of a sudden I, le I leant against the wall, and it just went flying across the room. <laughs> anyway. Oh, so this is... Um, I think it's the first time we've not had a guest with us. What? We've had, no, no. we've had at least two episodes where we haven't had guests. We, we haven't gone an episode yet without a celebrity guest, though. Yeah. Like, I've, I've just been so skilled in that way, getting us a celebrity guest for every episode. I know, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's the week that Devil Delgado didn't appear. We had no... And the week where we recorded with Toby and Chris show up. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, we're only on podcast episode 18 and we're still having fond memories. Oh, yeah. Oh, back in the days. <laughs> okay, it's going a bit fair, dude. Oh, well, technically it's last year, so technic uh, I won't go into technicalities. <clears throat> yeah, because you know I just whoop your ass on technicalities. Oh, so... Uh, we're not talking about that. Um, yeah, so... Shades of Reason, The Clone Wars. Ah, so, uh, I was... Spoiler alert, Maul died. <laughs> I joke, Fistler died. Yes, I was gonna say Maul died. What episode was I watching? <laughs> what episode were you watching? Uh, yeah, uh, look, people are sad that Previsla died. Yeah, same. But it was a necessary death, really. Yes. I mean, and it, I mean, dude, even if I hadn't read the spoilers, and of course I have, I've even got the book now, so I was able to spoil, spoil the lawless completely for myself, except the ending, because the book ends on the cliffhanger, but like, even if I didn't have the book, or uh, didn't know the spoilers, I, in fairness, pre death was pretty obvious throughout the Shades of Reason. Yeah. Well, the only thing that really made up for it was how epic it was, really, and the duel, I mean, that was epic. The, the question that comes to me, obviously it's not actually in the actual episode, but the picture we see after is, where is Previsla's head? I don't know. Has it just randomly gone into space? You know, the clone, well, I don't, to be honest, I don't know. I really don't understand the clones sometimes, though, they won't show certain things due to too graphic, I mean, Obviously, we can't pinpoint the actual scene, the beheadings of the Black Sun, you know, it's going to be on the DVD version. We can't point that to Clone Wars, that was censored by Cartoon Network. And I don't understand Cartoon Network sometimes. I mean, to me personally, and this is my honest opinion, Rick Thompson's floating skull is the darkest and creepiest thing we have seen in Star Wars history. And Cartoon Network didn't censor it. And that surprises me. It would seem exactly the kind of thing they would censor with Tamsin's floating skull. And yet they're censoring a lot less violent things, to be honest. Ah, uh, you know what Cartoon Network can be like. Yeah, but um, in this instance, yeah, it was the writers who chose to take it out. Uh, it was still a dead scene, definitely, and seeing the reaction to, like, Bo Katan and all. Like, um, I still think it was done with a bit more violence, but, you know, it was still pretty dark as it was. Well, we get to see the Emperor this week at last. Yeah. Shit's gonna get real, dude. Definitely. I've read, I've read the book, oh my god. No spoilers this time. I, all I'm gonna say is I can't actually believe they're gonna fit this all into 22 minutes. No, I'm almost actually worried now they're gonna leave the, ep the episode on a cliffhanger. And then I'm wrong in that the book is a cliffhanger, and I really hope it, the episode isn't. Well... Like I do have my own theories for what's going to happen <laughs> at the end of the episode. Like, it's a theory a few others, like Anthony share as well. Well, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens then. If you 
want to know the theory is that Sidious will take more letters of Juventus again, like a secret one, you know, Stir Killers, Vader's secret Juventus kind of thing. Mm. And really, that would make sense. Come on, Sam Witwer voices more. Sam Witwer voices Stair Killer. Vader's secret Juventus, and now it could be Sidious' secret Juventus. <laughs> well, there's some, cor some sort of link up there then. <laughs> Like, to me, that's definitely a good to look around, but yeah, Shades of Reason was a great episode. I mean, to be honest, though, when you think of Shades of Reason, you're honestly only really going to think of the most part the fact of, you know, Visceral's death, of course. I mean, that was a great group, like, so it's really easily the best in the show. Definitely, yeah. I won't go as far as to say what some people have said, like, that all, most of the other ones have been like just 20 seconds or 30 seconds, you know what I mean? Then I won't go that far. Like, I think the reason people say that is because this duel had more. And some like say they'll say it's going vroom, vroom, vroom. And just bashing their like tears off each other just for a while before someone dies, someone escapes, whatever. But, um, in this episode, you know, we had a lot of different things. Like, Vistler used all his weaponry, basically, Hong Kong. Like, he used his mandolin blasters, he used his jetpack, he used his dark saber, of course. He used his, um, dark things, you know, the ones that you see him come yeah. the face. He used his flamethrower, too, you know. Vistler used, like, every weapon at his disposal, basically, so... You know, we haven't seen that a lot in this show, to be honest, where a character has so much variety of weapons to use, really. And, like, Maul, of course, gave everything he had as well, and beat Vistler, and did it in quite an epic way as well, I mean. Because Vistler just shot with a brilliant shot, and Maul's legs are his hands. And Maul, he could have, like, easily used the force to grab his safe, as Vistler throws him. And the cliche stab him through the chest kind of thing, right as he arrived, this sort of him. But no, they made a great ending now, but you know, more, he's like more patient, more skilled, he's able to grab this sort of wrist and just make the move and disarm him, flick him over his head and beat the crap out of him, basically. And then when it's done, like, you know, that's that epic line by this, so, you know, what a last line for him to say, and then, of course, more be handsome. So, that was just one of the best death scenes in Star Wars, in my opinion, not just the Clone Wars. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it was... Like, if yeah, Filoni's going right insane, that this, that next week's, like, say, the duel is even better, then it's got to be really good. That means we're heading in the right direction, then. Yeah. What did you think of the episode? It was an epic episode. Um more towards the obviously the lightsaber but the deal which was really good um, I'm starting to forget some of the beginning of last week's episode but that doesn't matter I can remember the important parts which is good um, and also what still, what still kind of bugs me to interrupt is that um, they place more in Savage's cell that is yeah. so that is so weird I mean, I've read the book, you know, the book actually explains a lot of things that we don't actually see on screen, um, from what I remember. Uh, but, like, <laughs> just why would this have, like, more into Rosh's cell? Like, I'm not gonna, like, complain about um, the, you know, you know, the glass, you know, how weak the glass was. I mean, there's, o there's an obvious reason for that that a lot of people don't seem to realise. Mandalore's cells are designed to uh, hold corrupt people, like the politicians of season three. They're not intent. They weren't ever built or intended to hold monsters like Maul and Savage, or basically anyone with that kind of power, like the soldiers. They were meant, always meant to imprison corrupt people. But that's why the glass appears so weak in the episode, because Maul and Savage, you know. What they're of a much stronger caliber than the corrupt politicians. That's the reason why it was so easy to escape. You know, that's it's understandable actually 
what you think about why the glass is so weak. Of course, why won't it be the same cell? See, but that we also have to consider. You know, one of them would have broken the glass if the even if they're in different cells, and then would have gone over to the other and broken the cell of that one. Basically, what the Connors were with doing, and this is kind of silly thing, is that you know they basically didn't have time to put the brothers in two different cells, and then at the times like have one of them break the glass, and the other then free the other. Uh, but they didn't have the time to do that, basically, while writing yeah. it, so it would the same sound. But I'd still like to know, at least in some kind of like hint or report or something, what does happen to the criminals, like Black Sun and Pipes? I think they were executed on screen, in my opinion. I mean, Death Watch didn't need them after they replayed Mandalore, so it would only make sense they were all executed, in my opinion. Or just sent back to their planets. <laughs> yeah, that would really make sense, though, because like they know of what was going on in Mandalore. Like it would become knowledge. It's like the whole galaxy would fit quicker than it would normally. So like, yeah. <laughs> realistically, the only possible possibility is for them to be executed. But by the way, this is the spoilers, so don't worry about it. But I, from what I've read in a book, it seems that. The Lawless is set two weeks after, two weeks um, after Shades of Reason, so like, everything that's been going on has been going on a while. <laughs> it's kind of weird that it takes place two weeks, because you know, the team's been in a cell two weeks, um, you know, the smuggling civil war has been going on for two weeks without any casualties, probably. You know, it's kind of weird, to be honest. Uh, oh well, what can we do? I think someone might know about the situation on Mandalore within two weeks before certain messages the Jedi cancel. Eh, uh, yeah. I think really what they should have done is make it within a, the lawless a day after Shades of Reason, but if, I'm, if I remember right, it's like two weeks, I think. But something else that's interesting, and uh, the season three episodes, um, a corruption and the Academy, um, where we do see a lot of p corrupt politicians arrested. Um, it's said that in the uh, in the Lawless episode is set two years after those season three episodes. So that either means those two season three episodes were very near the start of the war, like and were before a lot of the other episodes, which I think is right because of Lee Ryan Cheese. On the log, the G or it on Star Wars stuff can't become right in the memory. Um, or that with the war is actually in its third and final year, unless they're planning to stretch it out longer. So I don't know. Like, it could be in its second year, but I don't know. I just think it's. Yeah. This is complicated. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you what, though. The Lawless has a lot of great references to, you know, previous episodes. You know, I'm, they, these aren't spoilers, but I will give a tidbits. You will see the four Mandalorian cadets from the Academy, Corky, Lagos, Sonny, and Amir. Amir, so they will all return. And like being much older, I mean, Daniel, I assume you've already seen the new Corky model. It's like there was lots of... Yeah, people. yeah, I did see that. Yeah, he doesn't look that much different. A bit older, and but not like... Ugly as well, it seems like age has gotten a bit ugly, to be honest. And um, Lagos, I've seen a picture of her new model, it doesn't really look that much different except the clothing. Um, but if I saw her right in a picture, the one I believe to be Sonny looks so, so different to how she looked in the academy. Like, it looks unreal how different she looks. She kind of looks goth, if anything. <laughs> um, what other references are? Oh, there will be an Anakin scene in the new episode. Uh, I mean, you know, I've read the book version of the scene, you know, and it does sound more like season two Anakin than the Anakin we hate in the more recent season, you know, season one and two Anakin, which was fine. Like, he seems more like that Anakin in this set, which is good, because, like, season one and two Anakin is the one I like. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, 
That's a great reference to Void of Temptation, where this is a bit of a spoiler. Anakin again calls Satine Obi Wan's girlfriend. And once again, Obi Wan does not deny it. Well, he again tries to, but then realizes it's pointless. <laughs> so it's pretty much like they're referencing Void of Temptation really me again. No, not spoilers, I'm just giving it tidbits. Don't worry, I want to give it the spoilers. Yeah. Huh? Why, and that's why Obi Wan gets the spoiler because he goes to Anakin saying basically, Is that old junk trader of yours still flyable? Uh, basically, <laughs> something like that. And Anakin says, Yeah, sure, you can have it. And of course, Obi Wan, you know, he won't be wearing it for long in two brief scenes the one where he's with Anakin and the one that in a brief of the movie scene, you can see him in Reiko Hedin's armor, which is a great reference to season four. The bandy on this, um, well, I'm trying to think. You know, of course, we can't go without mentioning this. Finally, after five seasons in the Clone Wars, we finally have seen Darth Sidious in the flesh. I mean, we can't go without mentioning that. Uh, I'm scared. Right, shit's gonna happen. Shit, yeah. shit's gonna go down. Like, I mean, I like I said, I read that book recently because I got for my birthday. Like, I knew the spoilers pretty much, but just it just seen reading the book version made my mind explode. Then again, to be honest, like I was rereading, I also read um, the book versions were Eminence and Shades of Reason. I believe it or not, I think. I actually think the book versions are a lot darker than the episode versions, believe it or not. I mean, just, like, of course, I'd seen Eminence and Shades of Reason before I read the book, and, uh, like, some of the more darker parts of the episodes, episodes actually made me wince more reading about them than, like, <laughs> seeing them. So I got more comprehension, or, or comprehended more. Uh, when it was said in words in the book, kind of strange, I know, but that's actually true. Yeah. Like, I really don't see how they can't make the lawless, like, hugely dead. Like, it's gonna be some dead scenes. And by the way, I just, I just have to randomly say this, but I think this Satine outfit in this end is the first low cut, uh, low cut gear, or low cut. Whatever you want to call it, basically low cut clothing that she's actually worn in all, all her appearances. <laughs> I just to randomly say it. She's in her prison, she's not going to be like what we used to see her. Well, no, dude, she was actually wearing the exact same gear outside of prison in this egg, too. And, and she was a reason even before she was captured in the palace and trying to calm the people down when this arrives, she's wearing that dress or whatever. She's downgraded. Not really, I think it's kind of smoking hot. <laughs> Trust you to say that. Well, well, she's already kind of smoking hot before. <laughs> so, like, I just, I think I know why the rose wire there to wear something uh, no, cub, but I'm not going to say why. <laughs> yes, keep your thoughts to yourself, no, Rory. No, no, no. Just no. for anyone listening and thinking I'm completely weird or insane, it is not that the writers wanted to be perverted and knew that every female character to wear the revealing clothes, because obviously that's not the case. I just think they want to make it darker. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, wow. That's all our topics? Are you sure? Yeah. Our one long topic. <laughs> well, we had the Clone Wars and we had the other topic, but David didn't join us. Yeah, he didn't. Again. And then the other one's not really a topic, it's just five words written down. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's all our topics then. Unless there's anything else you'd like to mention. Not really, no. I mean, neither of the two people got back to me on the 
special thing for the podcast. So, like, so yeah, always a little week. Oh well, then I shall start rolling down. And why didn't I see that coming? You can't see me. <laughs> oh, so. I, you know, staring at my picture lovely me does not count. <laughs> oh. Yes, I know you want to be ripped like I am, but seriously. <laughs> you know, I'm only joking, I'm not really ripped. I am slightly overweight. That's why my Skype friend actually, <laughs> boy, I looked ripped in my picture compared to <laughs> Just point, just point out there, people. Uh, so, make sure to check out our YouTube channels. Mine is www.youtube.com slash user slash 14 Mr. Das. Rari's is www.youtube.com slash user slash separatist destroyers. I got the power. Also, check out Rari, Rari's. Check out Rich's. <laughs> I am. Stop talking. Um, check out Rich. <laughs> It's 18 episodes and I still laugh at this point. Um, blah, 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 blah. Have you have you got a baby in that end by any chance? No, it won't fit in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to go. So check out Richard's IMBD profile www.imbd.com slash name slash nmo three three eight two seven o. And also check out Kellen's website at www.youtube.com <laughs> 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 slash user slash speedy the ac- speedy the voice actor. What yeah, what a name to have. Yeah, it just <laughs> my dirty mind. <laughs> you and your dirty mind, Rory. You and your nose. That nose is just weird. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no comment. <laughs> just, just wait until the show is done someday in May. Like the first thing I'll know is be able to distinguish you by is that nose. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just distinguish you by just randomly saying dirty jokes or something. No, I don't you mean, could be saying that to anyone. That would be Graham. I'll, I'll, now, here's how you can distinguish me at the event. Look for the guy with glasses who might be getting the actors to sign coded figures. Well, actually, I'm not too certain of it. It's on the agenda. Okay, look for the guy in glasses. He's going to be doing a creepy face. He's going to be standing beside... Oh, there's no good-looking guests at the event. Aren't <laughs> uh, yeah, we at the same hotel? <laughs> Oh yeah, good point. I'll just, I'll just... Just make, just make sure to tell me your room number that I'll come knocking and then you'll be like, who's there? And I'll be like, you're doomed. <laughs> I'll, when, when, I, when I check in, I'll just say, is there a Rary Williamson? Maybe, maybe I'll use a different name. <laughs> I'll just say, is there a kid that's come from Ireland? Who are you calling a kid? <laughs> Oh no wait, you t- you t- I'm 17, I'm legal to drive! <laughs> Terrorise the streets of Dublin. Oh god, yeah. Oh god. Drive, drive, drive! Yes. Well, your, your dad's not lending you his car, that's for sure. Why would I want to drive that rust buck anyway? It's like 2004 or something. I want to drive some old <laughs> you, you always start somewhere. Okay, that's it. I'm finishing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so yeah, so... So you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the event? You didn't want... I'm only, I'm only kidding. You didn't, want to t- you didn't want to talk about it. You wanted to wait it, so now you're going to wait. That's what she said. Ah, so, from me, Rari, Richard, and Helen. And the warder. Who's the warder? The warts so I'm drinking. Oh. <laughs> oh, don't forget the Ribena I've got in my room. Um. Ew, Ribena. Nerd. 
<laughs> uh, I'm an nerd, you're an nerd as well, so I hate to disappoint you there. <laughs> right, that's it. <laughs> and of course, I'm a self confessed nerd. Yeah. So, from all of us. May the wolf be with you. May the wolf be with you. <laughs> you actually said it. I didn't think you were going to. I was gonna, not going to say it, but then I thought I'd say it. And then you went and said it, so may the wolf be with you.